The Secrets of Star Trek is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, episode 117. Captain DeBridge. Spock here. Make it so. Surrender is not an option. Attention crew of the Enterprise, this is James Kirk. We are all explorers, driven to know what's over the horizon, what's beyond our own shores. We would have helped you get home if you had asked. That's who Starfleet is. Hi, I'm Dom Bettinelli, and you're listening to The Secrets of Star Trek, where we discuss the hidden layers and deeper meanings found in all the Star Trek TV series, movies, and more. And today we're discussing the Enterprise episode, Cold Front. Joining me today on the panel are Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. And Father Corey Stika. Hi, Father Corey. How's it going? Very well, thanks. Uh, folks, remember to like The Secrets of Star Trek on Facebook, where we're at facebook.com slash starquestmedia. You can follow us and retweet our episodes on Twitter at SQPN. Uh, and I do want to give you a reminder that if you are coming into the Secrets of Star Trek recently, we have a special podcast feed that contains all of our first 100 episodes of the show that you can find on our website if you go to sqpn.com slash trek. There's a link there to a special feed that has the first 100 episodes uh, because the way iTunes and the other directors work, they only show the most recent 100 episodes. So uh, go check that out. And there's a bit of news we want to cover. You probably have heard, if you are a Star Trek fan, that Star Trek Discovery Season 3 finally has a premiere date. Uh, It's coming on October 15th. Mm. So uh, that's when we will, and of course, as we have always before, we will be doing uh, episode-by-episode reviews of the uh, Star Trek Discovery Season 3 as it comes out. And also, if you're a patron supporter, you can hear our Lower Decks conversations now. Yes. As soon as Lower Decks finishes, the next week, Discovery starts. That's right. That's right. So uh, we we are d- discussing uh, Star Trek Lower Decks, the animated series, uh, week by week as the as they air for patrons, as a special benefit to patrons. And then at the end of that season, we'll bundle them all up, and uh, you might get a chance to hear those as a group after those are done. So uh, we're talking about Lower... I'm sorry. We're talking about Cold Front, <laughs> this Star Trek Enterprise episode. It is from the first season, as we've been going through the first season. And it involves this, I, uh, excuse this is an unintentional pun, overarching oh. story arc involving this temporal cold war. So the temporal cold war is a kind of prelude to the last great time war where the Daleks and the Time Lords destroy <laughs> each other. <laughs> right. You have the cold war before you have the hot one. Yes. So... In the Star Trek universe, there are apparently, we learn in this episode, a group of different factions that have time travel technology in different future centuries. Mm -hmm. And some of them, after time travel technology got invented, some of them used it for peaceful research with strict protocols to keep from changing the timeline. But other people, other factions have wanted to change the timeline to their own advantage, and they're trying to do that in violation of the temporal accords. So the the apparent good guys are trying to keep history on its normal track. They function like the Celestial Intervention Agency, or CIA, from Doctor Who, Mm -hmm. trying to repair damage to the timeline. And this is a concept that was basically proposed to the showrunners by the studio because Enterprise was going to be set, and originally was not even called Star Trek Enterprise, it was just called Enterprise, and it was set earlier than the original series, which means they wouldn't have all the futuristic whiz-bangery that they had on later Star Trek series, and the studio was kind of concerned about the lack of futuristic stuff, so they said, give us something futuristic more futuristic than just Mm -hmm. what you would otherwise be planning. And Mm -hmm. what they came up with was interference from the future via the temporal Cold War. And that actually is a really great idea that utterly fizzled out. 
Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. they it what they should have done is made it a major part. If they're going to do it, they should have made it a major part of the series. The idea of a temporal Cold War is something you could build an entire television series around. Right. right. And it should have been, if not the plot of this show, it should have been major. Because you need to build up the stakes in the Temporal Cold War, and you need to get to know the characters in the Temporal Cold War, and you need to be invested in that plot line. And you can't do that if you're getting one or two episodes about the Temporal Cold War season. Right. Which is kind of like, I mean, we got a little more than that, but it's not much. And so they never never did the concentrated storytelling they needed to to get us invested in this, and it just kind of fizzled. Yeah, out of 97 episodes of Enterprise, they had 13 having to do with right. the Temporal Cold War. So not, and the, and, not enough. And, and and not in the same degree in all of those. In some of them, right. it's just kind of like mentioned. Well, and they right. did introduce the Temporal Cold War right from the beginning. You know, the pilot, we see the shadowy figure in the, the time room, however you want to put it, the time delay mm-hmm. room. And Silic and all these, you know, the Suleban and all these uh, concepts are kind of introduced. But yeah, then you know we're what seven, eight episodes. I don't even remember like what 11. point this is. eleven. Yeah. So you yeah. we went ten episodes, and now we now we're finally re- revisiting it, right? For this right. one episode. That's right. Yeah. By the way, future guy, as they call him, because they never established his name, there was some thought, uh, and apparently at one point they were planning on doing a reveal in the end on who future guy was, and it was going to be a future version of Archer. Mm. Huh. Interesting. So uh, who had traveled some period of time in the future. Yeah. Interesting. One thing to to mention is that this episode was directed by Robert Duncan McNeil, Tom mm-hmm. Paris of Voyager, who has actually gone on since Voyager to actually did his big thing is he's actually a TV director. He's he's done more TV directing work than acting these days. Yep. So uh, interesting to, to note that he directed this episode. One thing I want to mention, because you bring up like, the studio's idea, because it's a precursor episode, a prequel, that's sort of Discovery's. Discovery is a prequel series. They didn't have any compunction about messing with you know cool whiz bang technology uh, <laughs> in it, but they have also introduced the to the time travel aspect. It's like they've revisited this idea in Discovery. With, mm-hmm. with well, the, well, with it's it. interesting because Daniel says that he's from the thirty first century, and of course, Discovery goes to the thirty second century. So yeah. it'll be interesting to see with Discovery coming up here shortly, will they play into that a little? Will there will they actually explicitly mention the, the Temporal Temporal. Cold War and things yeah. like this? Because we're just within a hundred years of where Daniels is from. Right. And I've been wondering is is the devastation we're apparently going to see to the Federation in the thirty second century fallout right. from the Temporal Cold War. Because mm. Daniels mentioned that he's not a part of Starfleet which right. could imply that Starfleet as they know it in the time from Enterprise to TNG doesn't exist anymore because the Federation as they know it from, from you know, TOS to TNG doesn't well, exist anymore. Apparently neither do Illinois and the Earth, but we'll get to that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> or how you defined Earth, yeah. It depends on how you define it. Well, let's, let's talk about this episode because it starts with Silic, the Suleban, in that time chamber being menaced by that uh, indistinct humanoid figure from the future who and apparently having some of his biological enhancements re- being removed as punishment yeah. for failures for failure they're taking away his eye implants yep. mm. and that's not nice but uh, uh th- this, uh, th- he's got a tough boss going here uh, so a demotivational boss <laughs> <laughs> yes and then we uh, switch to that's the the teaser the pre-credit teaser and then after the credits we have the Hoshi and Sato, we see them interacting, talking about movie night. Merryweather. Hoshi and Merryweather. Sorry, it's Hoshi, Sato, and Merryweather. I have my notes. <laughs> Mayweather. Mayweather. <laughs> They're talking about movie night on the ship, and they, they ended up watching Night of the Killer Androids. They reference the fact that the uh, database has 50,000 movies, and we have to watch you know, this one. And uh, I'm like, that sounds like Netflix. Why don't you just watch it in your quarters on your screen? You know that. Uh, but, well, you know, uh, of course, I was. Fun- it's funny because at the time, Netflix was still kind of not what it is today. It was still they yeah. still did the DVDs at that point. It was DVDs in the mail, yeah. But uh, That's true. You know, now we sit where we've got Hulu and Netflix and Amazon Prime <laughs> and Apple Plus, and and we still yep. go. 
there's nothing on. There's nothing to watch. <laughs> nothing I'm, to I'm watch. hearing 50,000 movies in your database. That's all? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. Really? Right. <laughs> Small database, guys. Small, yes. And then we have uh, Archer in the captain's uh, mess. He's getting served breakfast by d- this uh, figure, Daniels, who's a, apparently some type of uh, steward or yeoman. Who- who we've never seen before and thus are totally not invested in. Yep. <laughs> That's right. And uh he and we they tried to disguise why this guy's here by making him oh his role is to talk about the plot, you know, what's coming mm-hmm. up. Oh, I see the ship is headed for a stellar nursery and there's several ships inside that we're going to now divert from our course and go check out. So that's yeah. that Now, imagine how much more interesting this would have been if Daniels was a main character and had been all along. Yeah. That you know, be... if he was, and, and it's like, wait, y- y- I'm sorry. I've known you this whole time as our security chief or whatever. <laughs> and now you're telling me you're from the future. <laughs> and now you're well, a Maquis. Even... Yeah. <laughs> like, well, like we had in DS9. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, even not, even not so much me, a main character, but even if he was a re- reoccurring character where you saw him constantly, oh, yeah. You that, know, he that, was he was the one that was always serving them in the mess hall. He was the one you always saw kind of on the background of the bridge right. or something. That that would be the intermediate. But I want to push it for drama. It's like, how invested would we be in temporal Cold War if all of a sudden one of our main characters is from the future? If it were Reed, for example. Yeah, if you know, Reed this. has like always been a plant from the future. Of course, then we'd possibly lose that character. And they, yeah. I think they, that was one step too far for them to go, I guess. But yeah. uh if it were today, I could see them totally doing that and sacrificing a character just mm-hmm. to do that. Well, one thing I one thing I did like about this scene though was it kind of shows like we see with lower decks, both the 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 original T, TNG episode and uh, the, the, the series that's on yep. now is the low, people down below don't always know what's going on on the ship. You know, the, right. they're just on the ship doing their jobs, and oh, we happen to fly into a stellar nursery all of a sudden. Oh, I didn't realize we were heading that way. Yeah. That's true. Hmm. Uh, One and and another kind of missed tick in this episode is, so he brings him scrambled eggs and something else that's hard to see. Maybe it's sliced tomatoes. And after he goes, Archer reaches forward and we see that they have the stupidest salt and pepper (laughs) shakers in history. Because what these look like is they want them to be different and thus futuristic, but they're different, futuristic, and stupid. Yeah. (laughs) Because what they look like is aspersoria. Yep. You know, if if an aspersorium is a rod that you use in church, it's got like a ball with holes in it on one end, you dip it in a bucket of holy water, and then use the aspersorium to sprinkle the congregation with the holy water. Well, these are like teeny little aspersoria, one of which holds salt and one of which holds pepper, apparently, but they're balled down. So all of, they're sitting on a little stand. All of the, all, you, you pick it up by the handle and all of the salt and pepper is going to drain out of it as you're getting it towards your plate to season your food. <laughs> you're going to be trailing salt and pepper across the table. And if you don't put it exactly right in the little stand, it's all going to leak out between uses. So this is the stupidest idea for how salt and pepper shakers should work I've ever seen. You can apparently buy them. Online. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> now, I would assume the holes are on the top. So you're holding it from the, the, the handle on the top and the holes are on the top. Oh, and then when you, well, as you tip it, then it sprinkles. That is also stupid, but It is so. a stupid design but it looked oh, futuristic. This is an actual product from an Italian designer, a design italiano from Olesi Officiale. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> oh, it's, it's official. Easy. It's Officiale. <laughs> uh, so it's a real salt and pepper shaker thing well, that they picked up at the store. <laughs> well, it's, it's about like, you know, uh, TNG using the Bodium glassware. You can still get, you can still get versions of the, the TNG style glassware. So, I mean, that's right. Makes sense. Yeah. That, I mean, the winter prop designers go. They go to the store and they buy something that looks cool. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that so, so salt and pepper shakers. You didn't think you'd get salt and pepper shaker talk on this uh, Secrets of Star Trek, folks, but that's what we're about. <laughs> I, I think about everything. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, do you see the details? We're in the details. So, uh, when they get to the the Stella Nursery, Archer hails one of the ships, and the captain Fratic is uh, sort of this abrupt sort of fellow. He's uh, he's not all that forthcoming. He's busy. He's got a job to do. 
these, these, I, I like Captain Fraddock. So first of all, he's a green lizard man. Yep. And second, he's got the name Fraddock, which is <laughs> really human sounding. So uh-huh. I like having this alien with a human sounding name. He's also, as you say, he's abrupt. He's not particularly helpful, but he's also not particularly unhelpful. He's someone that is being set up in such a way that, you know, could he be a villain or is he just a kind of grouchy guy? And the truth is, he's just a kind of grouchy guy. Yeah. He's not a villain. <laughs> he just That's wants right. to do his job. Leave me alone. This is my ship and I'm going to stay on my ship. That's him. The, sc- the script kind of describes him as gruff, looks as weather-worn as his ship. He's like an old salt, you know, mm-hmm. what you'd mm-hmm. expect. Uh, so he's escorting some religious pilgrims to see the Great Plume of Agasoria, uh, a protostar that gives out a neutron blast on some schedule, some regular basis, uh, that they view as a religious event for the, from uh, people from uh, Baratha. Uh, no Barathans died to bring us this information. Oh. Um, <laughs> mm. So um, in, in Archer decides that this is a great opportunity. He invites pilgrims to visit Enterprise if they're willing, and they come aboard. And uh, apparently they speak English, by the way. Well, they've got translators, I guess. But, <laughs> but I like how they're from multiple different planets. Mm-hmm. You yeah. know, so apparently the Agasoria worshippers are a significant space religion that has followers on multiple different planets. And so they are from multiple planets. They also do a custom that Archer should have been anticipating yeah. because they bring gifts. And mm-hmm. when you meet new people, even in human history, bringing gifts is a norm. Yep, you yep. know, if you're greeting dignitaries. So they bring him a kind of weird clock and a bottle of space whiskey for <laughs> use during the blooming of the great plume of Agasoria. And Archer doesn't have anything to give them. In, and he blunders over this. What he should have said, well, thank you. And as a return gift, we've prepared a feast in your honor. Right. Mm-hmm. So he actually had something to give them. He just wasn't thinking about it and wasn't quick enough on his feet as a diplomat to reframe the meal he was already planning on serving them as right. his return gift. I like that the Agasaurians are not really rigid in their beliefs because yes. they usually yep. have a fast, but uh, they're gonna, they'll break that fast for... Uh, Hospitality reasons. Yeah, yes. and that's nice. That shows them as being reasonable. There's a story, I forget, is it Teresa of Avila? But there is a story about one of the female saints in her monastery during Lent, and a huntsman had, like, killed a couple of partridges and left them for food, and they depended mm. on, you know, people for food. And it's it was Lent, and at the time, the custom was you don't eat meat during Lent. Right. Yeah. And so these partridges show up that the huntsman has given them, and they're wondering what to do about them because it's Lent, and St. Teresa or whoever it was says, well, Lent is Lent, and partridges are partridges. So (laughs) we're not letting this food go to waste. Yes, that sounds like something Teresa would say. (laughs) Well, I should point out one of the pilgrims is a silic in disguise. Uh, It's fairly obvious it's the same same guy, uh, but uh, has a different appearance. And as they learn more about what these Ag- Agosoria people believe, it, it, they believe in this cycle of renewal and rebirth in the universe, which is what the plume that occurs on a regular basis symbolizes. And Phlox compares that to the Hindu belief in cycles of the universe, even though it's not really the same thing. But we have some nice stuff here where Phlox has made a study of religion. Mm-hmm. On Earth, yeah. Uh, multiple religions. And yeah. so when he was on Earth, for example, he learned obviously about Hinduism, yep. mm-hmm. at least some about it. He also said he spent time in a Tibetan monastery, mm-hmm. so that would presumably be Diamond Vehicle Buddhism. Yep. He attended Mass at St. Peter's Square, so apparently they moved it outdoors into the square and not in the cathedral. <laughs> well, it might, have, it might have been a big. It might have been a big. Mass. It might have been an overflow mass, sure. Yeah. And he observed the Tal Shinar ceremony at the Vulcan Consulate. Well, it's good to know that there's still the the Pope is still in the Vatican. In that's the that's what I was going to say. It's, it's good to know St. <laughs> Peter's Square still exists, although we don't know. Maybe it's been you know destroyed and rebuilt once before. Depends on how you define St. Peter's Square. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So uh, when uh, I thought it interesting when Archer was was asked by the uh, alien Mantus. Uh, about his faith, he demurs. Oh, I keep an open mind, he says. 
uh, which is an interesting dodge. Yeah, which is a typical of 90s um, 90s sci-fi leaders. I mean, you have the same yeah. thing with, like, uh, Bruce Boxleitner's character on Babylon 5. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. As opposed uh, to actual hardcore, you know, believer, atheist, like Admiral Adama, or believer yep. in the gods, like uh, President... Um, Rosalind. What's her name? Rosalind. 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 Yeah. Or uh, Jeffrey Sinclair, who is Catholic. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. That's right. So uh, on the bridge, there's a, while the captain's, you know, hosting the visitors, uh, Reed's in charge, but something goes wrong with the sensor and he has to leave the bridge and leaves Mayweather in command for the first time while he's off the bridge. And we have a, a little play for a little bit of comedy of Mayweather feeling above himself and sitting in the captain's chair. I didn't take it that way. I thought this was a really nice get. Well, the first thing I thought is Hoshi should totally not be in this scene because as the translation specialist, she ought to be down at the reception <laughs> in case there mm-hmm. are diplomatic issues. Yeah. But get, setting that aside, she and and Mayweather are left in are left on the bridge and Mayweather gets to be in command for the first time. And this is a really nice character moment. Mm-hmm. You know, it, and she is the one who encourages him. It's like, aren't you going to sit in the chair? You know, <laughs> yeah. and like every fan or lots of fans anyway, would want to sit in the chair if they visited oh, yeah. the set. Right. And and he's like, no, nah, I can wait. And she's like, OK. And so she kind of goads him into sitting in the chair <laughs> and he does. And he says, wow, the bridge looks different from here. And it's just, I it, it's a nice character moment. Yeah. And then when Mayweather comes in, it's like, oh, may I take my station? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and and it's just, it's some nice, fun, yeah, you know, character dynamic stuff. I didn't view it at all as Mayweather being big for his britches. If anything, it was uh, Hoshi who egged him into just That's sitting true. there for a minute. Yeah. That's true. Well, it, it was nice because Mayweather really, throughout the series, never got a lot of character development. And, and no. the actor... Recently, yeah. has talked about that where he he really feels like it was kind of a lost opportunity for this character where he was just kind of a set piece. Mm-hmm. Yep, he's a boomer. That's all about all we knew of him. So, meanwhile, in the engine room, Tucker is giving a tour to a, a group of the pilgrims and gives an overly simplistic explanation of warp drive, and then finds out that they're all experts on warp technology. One of them's <laughs> a, a warp field theorist. I thought that was kind of funny. And while that's all going on, the, the silicon disguise does something to the engine. He sort of sabotages it. He, he mm-hmm. pulls something out. Uh, we're not sure what. So it looks like he's damaging it. Which is, well, he uh, is damaging we're... it. He cuts yeah. what we later find is an antimatter relay. Right. Uh, but uh, for not the reasons we think. Meanwhile, Captain Fraddick calls the Enterprise and suggests they, they need to fly around a plasma storm. And the Enterprise starts suffering damage from the storm. And at one point, there's like a cascade failure. They're going to explode. But whatever Silic did to the engine prevented it from exploding. They all would have died and Silic, but Silic was there to stop it. So he's, he's changed history by saving enterprise, which is an interesting thought because that means that the timeline we know of in the future is a broken timeline. Shall we say a a manipulated timeline? Who who knows how many times it's been rewritten. (laughs) And maybe the timeline we know in the future is the, proper one where the Enterprise wasn't supposed to be destroyed in this storm, but because it could have been destroyed in this storm, by changing it in the past, they made it so it's the proper one. <laughs> I'm just being, I'm being yeah, silly. I, you know, you, you get into these way. holy time loops where, where it's like, it really shouldn't have been destroyed, but it was destroyed, so they went back and made it so it wasn't destroyed. You know, it's the theory, though, that, you know, if there are time travelers, let's say, you know, yeah. 200 years from now, we develop time travel technology. The timeline we know now is the one that they affected. Right. You know, it's it going off of that theory. Branching timelines, yeah. This is part of the failure of the storytelling in this, is we never get answers yeah. to any of this. And they really do try to portray Silic as a, kind of a villain, but he saved your life here. Yeah. Right. And how can you really trust Daniels? What do you know about him other than the fact that he's mostly human, according to him? Silic says or implies that the antimatter cascade that would have destroyed the ship was was intentional, that somebody, not him, somebody caused that, and yeah. and that would point to Daniels, and they never explore that. 
And right. and they never really give us an explana- a good explanation. They do raise the question, why should we trust Daniels, who comes forward at this point and announces himself as a time traveler to Archer. But uh, they don't fully explore that. Now, I could handle it if we had an inconclusive resolution to this episode about we don't know who to trust. That would be an interesting thing. Mm-hmm. Even if we got through this crisis, but Archer said, you know, we got through this one, but I don't know who to trust in the future. That would be interesting storytelling. But they don't do that. They, yeah. they don't address these issues. They take the simplistic way out where Daniels is the good guy, despite evidence to the contrary, mm-hmm. and never follow up on it. And so it's part of the failure of this. I do like, though, that when Daniels comes forward now, now that they've survived the blowing up of the ship, which like, Okay, he he should have said, well, if I was behind it, why would I be on the ship when that happens? Right. right. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they never say that. But he comes up to Archer in the hall and wants to talk to him about something important. And Archer initially pushes him off and says, can you, I've got stuff I'm dealing with. Can you please talk to one of the bridge officers? And it's like, finally, Star Trek acknowledges the chain of command. <laughs> right. Right. So that was nice. Yeah. But uh, Daniels proves he knows more than he ought. He knows that Archer fought Silic on the Helix and from the first episode. Uh, and, he, and he tells him Silic is aboard, and he gets Archer to come to his quarters because he's got something to show him, uh, and reveals he's from 900 years in the future, at which point Archer says, so you're saying you're some kind of time traveler? No, no, <laughs> I'm saying I am a time traveler. Yeah. I'm just some kind of one. <laughs> Star Trek, some kind of. Uh, it, the fact that Robert Duncan McNeil directed this makes me wonder whether he put that in there mm, <laughs> on purpose. purpose. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he shows them the Temporal Observatory, which is a virtual reality experience that shows the timeline, basically. Nice 22nd century Game Boy you got there. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially, yes. And so it's what helps him keep track of the time stream, and he explains that when like we said before, when regular time travel was invented, all the species capable of it agreed on a temporal accord, and some people are ignoring the, the, the laws for their own benefit. And that's apparently 100 years from now, because in the time of the original series, they're doing time travel, and they're doing it for research purposes. Mm-hmm. I mean, right. there's a whole episode where the Enterprise is back in the 20th century just to do research. Right, right, right. Yeah, that's the, the Gary mm-hmm. Seven episode. So he uh, he tells him that Silic prevented the reactor breach. Daniel said he was assigned to the Enterprise, apparently to get on board months ago when they left Earth, to capture Silic when he came aboard. And he, now he needs Archer's help because he needs access to the sensors and Archer's command codes. <laughs> and this is where we're supposed to go. <laughs> yeah. You're, I'm going to just hand over the command codes to the ship to you now that you've told me that you've been uh, deceiving me. Which, to his credit, Archer b- does bring up, but he kind of well, gives in pretty easily. They, they don't. They don't bring it up earlier. Oh, also, he Daniels tells him that the bad, the earlier factions in the Temporal Cold War can't fully manifest in our right. time, which they can yeah. only do that partially because the technology wasn't perfected yet. And yet, he says that future guy is from the twenty eighth century. Mm-hmm. So it was like, right. dude, you should. I mean, the Enterprise already had this down in the 2300s. <laughs> right. So, right, yeah. so there's something r- wrong there. But then I have in my notes for his pitch to uh, Daniel's pitch to Captain Archer is, I need you to help me capture Silic, even though he just saved you. And I need to access your sensor grid and have your command codes. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's like not the best pitch I've ever heard. No. Can I give you anything else? <laughs> yeah. It, I, if I was Archer, it would be, okay, I'll consider letting you access the sensor grid, but I'm only giving you editing privileges and I'm not making you a full yep. sysadmin. Thank you. <laughs> exactly. That's right. That's right. <laughs> CHMod uh, 766. So <laughs> to, <laughs> to Paul, uh, meanwhile, uh, says very confidently that the Vulcan Science Directorate has determined that time travel is impossible. It's is you know great because of the, course they have because yep. of course they have. <laughs> uh, and Tucker is also skeptical, but uh, and uh, as the so Flox is going on a field trip, a little a oh, sleepover. I, I, I like one of uh, to Paul's bits of skepticism. Oh yeah, yep. is uh, well if he's a time traveler and he wants to capture Silic, why not just go back one more day and catch him then? 
<laughs> yes. Which, which is, is a common problem, and they so they hang a lantern on it, but they don't resolve it for us. I suppose like they can't... Like, the, my guess is because Daniels had to join the ship at, on Earth, they can't just jump onto the ship at whatever they want, you know? Uh, uh, that's my yeah, guess. Yeah, maybe. Because you might just have this random, you know, mess steward that just suddenly shows up, say, at the beginning of the episode that no one's ever seen before. You can't have that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I do. Oh, speaking of him being a mess steward, when Archer says, give me one reason I should believe you yeah. or, or trust you. Because uh, he already believes him based on the Space Game Boy yes. presentation that he's seen. Give me one reason I should trust you. And he says, you like your eggs, your scrambled eggs soft. Have I brought them to you any other way? <laughs> and it's like, I'm sorry, fish custard was more meaningful than that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I guess it's meant to be sort of endearing of I care about you so much I bring you your eggs the way you like them. Right. I haven't poisoned you yet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I say that. <laughs> So uh, yeah, so Flox goes on a field trip uh, over to the to to the other ship, and as they approach the plume, Archer decides that he's going to invite some of the pilgrims back aboard because they they're pretty sure that the, at least somebody w among the pilgrims tried to sabotage the ship, and so one of them might be Silic, as Daniel says. And so, um, uh, meanwhile, Archer is pumping Flox for information about the pilgrims as they in the mess hall, and uh, Flox is confused by his suspicions in engineering daniels is doing his thing with the sensors while tucker asks him about the future and this is where he says uh earth exists in a manner of speaking as does illinois depending on how you define it which is very interesting he shows that he has a device that lets him walk through walls it's Chekhov's wall walking device yep. it will be important later in archer's quarters uh we see porthos barking at nothing uh but because silic is there and hidden and so Silic pops up, and he tells Archer that Daniels is the one Archer should be worried about, although he doesn't know about Daniels in particular. He's just whoever whoever the time traveler is that's on board, you need to worry yeah. about. He's he's detected a tachyon signature that's inconsistent with their technology, so he knows mm -hmm. someone from the future is here. Yep. He infers that that person is hunting him. He wants Archer to identify or help him identify that person. So basically, Archer is being approached by two different time agents who are each trying to I, want Archer's help to identify the other. Yeah. And he says, oh, did they tell you the story about we're the good guys upholding the temporal accords? No, they're just another faction trying to manipulate things to their advantage. Look at what almost happened to your ship. And at this point, I'm going, you know, saving the ship from an antimatter explosion kind of trumps fulfilling a special request for your breakfast order. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, it trumps 12 eggs, totally does. Yeah. yeah. And I do like, to, there's a neat bit of writing here. I, I do like the, how they would, T'Pol calls Archer on the intercom, and oh. the way Silic finds out who the who his enemy is, is she spills the beans with his name. Like, oh, and Daniels has got the sensors up and running. Uh, I, I had a different reaction to this writing, because T'Pol calls on the intercom, and Archer goes to answer, and Silic like, pulls out a gun. And Archer, it's like, that thing you have just put Daniels on an assignment with right. Trip and T'Pol. T'Pol is calling you. What is she going to want to talk about at this moment? Yeah, and you're letting her come on speakerphone. <laughs> right. yeah. It's like, I'm sorry. This is Archer. You're being an idiot. You're going to give away who this is, and ex that's then exactly mm -hmm. what happens. I would have well, told totally, yeah. She spills the beans. He Archer could have said, I'm sorry, I can't take your call right now. <laughs> Please call back yeah. in ten minutes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh yeah, Silic hears overhears and stuns Archer uh, so he can go find Daniels and deal with him. Uh the plume begins and uh Flox is taking part in the religious ritual, which look is apparently emotionally moving for him. He's he's got tears in his eyes. I thought it was rather awkward, though, that they're lead and also a little he's not even a member of your religion. He's just an interested yeah. ob observer. And you're letting him lead you in the prayer that he would barely yeah. know. There, there's, yeah. there's a great uh, blooper on this, though, where the, one of the times where he tried to do it, he started up and just just completely screwed it up. And uh, <laughs> there's a there's a YouTube channel that does intakes where they takes 
the, the episodes where there's these bloopers and he merges the bloopers back into the episode. Oh, fine. As if it was the actual broadcast. And I'll have to send a link to the to this uh, particular blooper because it, it's pretty funny to see Flox's reaction, kind of how he <laughs> places it in and everything. That's yeah. good. I personally, I would, if I had someone interested in Christianity, I would not like immediately invite them to lead everybody in the Lord's Prayer. Right, right. Although, I can imagine, there are certain people I can imagine doing that. <laughs> so, mm, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So uh, Daniels, meanwhile, detects Silic's presence, and so they evacuate engineering. I'm not sure why. No, you got a threat in engineering. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So they're getting people out of the way. Yes. Uh, so they, well, Silic then shoots Daniels and apparently kills him. Daniels just looks like he explodes. And so uh, to Paul and, uh, Tr- and Trip are outside the door to engineering and see Silic inside. So... They close the door and leave him in there and go to the captain's quarters. And don't lock it. <laughs> yeah. What, what? Do you not call security? Come down and watch the door and make sure you can't get out? I, do well, something. They, I think they did call. They did allude to calling for security. We just, I guess. I think it, we didn't see it on camera. Well, uh, at, well, at this point, Archer, now that he knows that Silic is still aboard, finally tells Reed to lock down all the hatches. Yeah. And then Archer takes to Paul to Daniel's quarters where... They find that the temporal observatory is missing. So Silic has the Game Boy. Yes. Uh, Hoshi says someone has transmitted an encrypted message. Silic squishes his way through an access panel heading for the launch bay. So Archer uses Daniel's uh, Chekhov's uh, wall walking device to walk through the walls to follow him. I'm not oh. sure why he doesn't just go to the launch bay <laughs> the usual way and send security there. Yeah. Well, he's uh, yeah, he's apparently messing with something in the in the walls. I think he was like s- s- sending the message from there, or yeah, disabling the hiding. launch bay controls, or something, or something. But yeah. he's but Archer goes after him with the hand device, right? Yep. And it's like your security chief is right there. <laughs> yes. and which one of you is more qualified to confront the dangerous weapon wielding guy? And whose job is it to do that? <laughs> Who's more expendable? <laughs> Apparently yeah. the captain. Uh, so Archer catches them. They fight. Silic drops something at one point. Is it his weapon or something? Yes. Yeah. That's yep. why he can't just stun Archer again. Okay. Well, he gets away because when the ship is hit by something, but uh, Archer catches up to him in the shuttle bay, uh, shoots the temple observatory out of his hand so that he can't get away with it. But Silic opens the launch bay and the air takes forever to rush out. There was a lot of air in that, <laughs> that uh, launch bay, which takes Daniel's wall walking technology with it, by the way, it gets sucked out off of Archer's hand. Yeah. So all the future technology is gone by the yes. end of this episode. How convenient. Very convenient. That that happened. And Silic jumps out to be rescued by a yeah. Sulaban ship. Apparently there's gravity somewhere below the ship in the middle of this nebula or the stellar nursery because everything is falling down. Archer, the tech. I thought that was just because the explosive decompression was blowing downward through the open right. shuttle bay. Well, which I, well, I figured by this point it was all decompressed. It's, it's a giant hole. Well eventually, yeah. well, eventually it does decompress and you can yeah. see him walking normally until he opens yeah. the door again. But And yeah. I actually like that. I like the fact that the air eventually does go out and he's not automatically dead. Right. Yeah. He's he's able to, you know, just get back up and make his way to the door and hit the panel to come back into the air filled corridor. That was actually I like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh Silic is uh picked up by a Suliban ship. Uh, and then uh, in the denouement, in the uh, the wrap up, Archer orders that Daniel's quarters be sealed because who knows what other technology oh. is in there. Um, and then Come we have an on. <laughs> ominous music over the lingering shot of the magnetic seal that Reed has placed on the door. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Also, when the shuttle, when the Suliban shuttle pod goes to warp, they're like, "Should we follow it?" And Archer is like, "No, let them go." Why? Uh, why? <laughs> um, <laughs> Can you outmatch a shuttle pod? Yes. The, and But then they seal off Daniel's room, and it's like you don't investigate and catalog everything that's in that room immediately? Right. Really? You have mm. tactical knowledge now that you're in the middle of a battlefield in a Cold War. You're a proxy state like South Korea or South Vietnam. 
during the <laughs> yeah. Cold War, and you have just detected activity from people who you don't know if you can trust them or not operating in your territory, and you don't even inventory their stuff? Mm. Really? Yeah. yeah. Also, if, uh, like, I, 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 even if I'm convinced Daniels is a good guy and is is trying to do good in the timeline or in the world, it's like, I want to know about your timeline. You just dropped references to Earth maybe not being there. <laughs> Frankly, I am under no obligation to help you preserve your timeline, morally right. speaking. Yeah. I want to know, if I'm going to preserve a timeline, I want to know what's in it. Right. Mm. That's right. It, the, the, yeah, there's no moral uh, requirement that you preserve any, a time that is your future. Right. Yeah. yeah, you make the future. My actions make the future timeline. If you're telling me, "Hey, there's this great way it could play out if you help me," that's like everybody else who comes to me every day and says, "Hey, let's do this great thing." <laughs> right. I, I want evidence that this is really going to be great before we do it. <laughs> well, and one thing that th that will come out of the literally come out of Daniels's quarters that they, they'll end up using later on is they'll they'll create this idea of the temporal database that they will use a right. couple times. In future episodes, yeah, they do. So, they do eventually go back to his his room. If I remember right, it's the next time yes, Daniel shows up because he's yeah. he's not really dead. He's not dead yet. <laughs> not quite dead yet. I'm feeling better. <laughs> so, uh, Father Corey, <laughs> any uh, last thoughts about this episode, uh, Cold Front? Uh, nothing here. Jimmy, nope. All right, so that does it for this uh, temporal Cold War episode. We'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make it possible for us to create. The Secrets of Star Trek, including Josh P., Brendan K., Blair N., Sarah S., and Rachel L. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue The Secrets of Star Trek and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. We'd also like to thank Victor Lambs, who edits the show for us every week. So that's it from us. What did you think of Cold Front? You can let us know by commenting on the show at sqpn.com slash trek or our Facebook page at facebook.com slash starquestmedia, or send an email to trek at sqpn.com. And we'll be back next time when we'll be discussing the Star Trek Discovery first season episode, Into the Forest I Go, which is the end of the first half of that season. So it's the, the mid-season finale. Until then, Father Corey Stika, thank you for joining me in sharing the secrets of Star Trek. Thank you, Dom. Jimmy Aiken, thank you as well. Thank you, and live long and prosper. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to The Secrets of Star Trek on StarQuest. And remember, there's a difference between keeping an open mind and believing something because you want it to be true. 